The capstone of any multivariable calculus course that I know of consists of the divergence theorem as well as Stokes' theorem, which are two fundamental integral theorems that have great importance in physics, uh, and both of them talk about the surface integral of a vector field, so that's what we have to start with if we want to fully understand these theorems. The motivation slash derivation of the surface integral of a vector field will be physical and we will also talk about a physical scenario namely electric flux in a more elaborate example before we get there we will talk about some examples that, that get us into the right place so we can actually handle the computations and as we have done in some presentations in this course at the end we also will say a few words about uh, pathological geometrical situations that can happen with non-orientable surfaces. So let's take a look at uh, what surface integrals of vector fields are about. So basically the reason why we are interested in these things is because the interaction of vector fields with their surroundings really is what makes a lot of physics work. For example, wireless communication is the interaction of the electromagnetic field with an antenna and that certainly sounds a bit old school, right? Wireless communication. Well, that's basically what cell phones are. They are wireless communication devices and if you're looking at all sorts of uh, computer communications as well as human communications that are happening these days, they are going through wireless devices. Uh, then on a more industrial from a more industrial point of view, electric motors are also something where the electromagnetic field is being used to turn electric current into mechanical energy, namely rotation. And if you really want to go old school sailboats, that's a very nice way to also visualize the interaction of a vector field, namely the velocity field of wind with a sail, and that is really going to be the first motivation, uh, the first visualization that we're going to use to derive the surface integral. Uh, the surface integral of ve vector field namely measures how much field goes through a surface and that means that a fluid flow really is a good visualization where you have something like a test surface and you literally measure how much fluid goes through the surface in unit time for example. However I should also say here that uh, this is a good visualization, however, fluid flow has the hardest governing equations, the Navier-Stokes equations, and we will not be discussing fluid flow explicitly here uh, in terms of solving equations, in terms of um, predicting motion and things like that, but we will use it as a very nice interpretation. And as I mentioned before, vector calculus, this vector calculus here, is the pinnacle of calculus and so it's, it's going to be challenging on a conceptual as well as on a computational level so hang on for the ride. It's, it's going to be fun, it's going to test just about everything we have done in all the calculus we have learned so far but that's what makes mastering this stuff ultimately so rewarding. So the motivation is that we want to look at the flow of a field through a surface, well, or the flux of a field through a surface. And, well, what we do know is that surfaces can have all sorts of curvy shapes, and vector fields certainly can also vary in space. So we go back to the mantra, if you will, of calculus, which is that if you zoom in far enough on a situation such as a surface, everything straightens out. So this green flat plane here is a an arbitrary surface in space but under such high magnification an arbitrary differentiable surface in space but under such high magnification that the surface cannot be distinguished from a plane anymore. Uh, this surface sits in a vector field so it is something like what the physicists might call a test surface and the vector field is indicated by these lines here which are supposed to indicate vectors and again if we uh, magnify strongly enough and the vector field satisfies the right technical conditions then the vector field in fact is homogeneous locally it consists of parallel vectors. K 
Okay, now comes the physical interpretation. Let's pretend that these four vectors here, which of course there are more here, right? It's a field that goes through every part of this surface. But let us imagine that this, these vectors indicate a fluid flow velocity and that this length is about how much vector goes through the, um, through the surface in unit time. So this is uh, the distance per second that the fluid here travels, for example. Well, when that happens, then in that one time, the field, in the, in the time of one second, the field permeates this membrane, this surface, and as it does so, if this is a fluid flow, then in one time unit, the fluid flow transports fluid through the surface, as you can see here in this ever-repeating animation, that as the vector goes through the surface, I'm indicating with this blue parallel epipet that there is fluid that has, transport, has been transported through the surface from below the surface. And what the surface integral of a vector field now measures is how much volume a vector field, a, a fluid flow field, would transport through a surface in unit time. And to compute that, well, we again look at this situation as it is under high magnification. And under high magnification, this fluid flow transports literally a differential um, parallel epiped through the surface, which means if we can figure out the volume of these little parallel epipeds and then add them up with an integral, we will get the net volume that is transported through a surface that if we zoom out will now also have curves by a vector field which as we zoom out will also vary in space. So what we will need to recall for that of course is the volume formula for a parallel epiped and that was this triple product of the cross product of the two vectors that span the uh, parallelogram at the bottom and at the top with uh, and then taking the dot product of that cross product with the vector that spans the height. And we're going to see that in just a second in the derivation. So now let's take a look at that surface from a little bit farther away. And when we do that, we look at a parametric surface with a parameter domain for parameters u and v. The parametric surface itself is a function s that maps the domain to a surface that is this kind of a sheet, right? And if we set v equals constant, we get horizontal lines in the domain, which become part of a coordinate grid, a curved coordinate grid on the surface. If we set u equal, that's v equals constant, if we set u equals constant, we get vertical lines in the domain, which turn into coordinate lines for a coordinate grid on the surface for lines u equals constant. And what in the previous animation was a parallelogram, of course, we know that as soon as the parallelogram is not entirely microscopic, it is the image of a rectangle that is an approximate parallelogram, but which has curved sides and also uh, certainly then angles that are not right angles between the sides. But we also know from the surface area analysis that we did in a, an earlier presentation that we can compute the area of this thing because we can take a little area element dA in the domain, which is spanned by a vector du and a vector dv. And we realize that this vector du is now magnified by the factor ds du to become the vector ds du times du that spans this side of the image uh, of the image approximate parallelogram. This vector dv is being mapped to ds dv times dv, which is a little vector here that spans the other side of this approximate parallelogram that is the image of this right, uh, rectangle. And in the surface area presentation, we have seen that now this gives us a little surface area element ds. Well, for the surface integral, it actually gives us a normal surface area vector ds as a vector. And what we then know from the formula for the volume of a parallel epiped is that the 
approximate volume that a vector field f that can stand at an angle with ds transports through this little approximate parallelogram in unit time will be the vector field dot ds so the okay so and ds first of all ds is just the cross product of these two vectors so it's ds du cross ds dv times du dv so now the volume that a vector field would transport through this little approximate parallelogram is vector field at this point dot ds so the volume the delta v that the vector field would transport through the parallelogram that is cornered at the parameter values u0 v0 which would be this point here is vector field dot ds du times delta u cross ds dv times delta v you can see that's uh, one side of the parallel epiped cross the other side of the parallel epiped dot dot with the f which i didn't draw in this picture which is the third side of the parallel epiped as we had seen on the previous panel in the animation well here i can factor out the delta u and delta v and so i end up with vector field at the point times ds du at the point cross ds dv at the point times the delta u delta v which is our area element in the domain so that means to define the surface integral we simply talk our way through the whole thing again we are getting our vector valued surface area element as something that for a parametric surface that maps a parameter domain in u and v via a function s to a surface that sits in space and which takes a coordinate grid on the surface and maps it uh, on the domain and maps it to a coordinate grid on the surface more lines on the domain mapped to more lines on the surface and which takes an area element in the domain and maps it to a this time vector area element in the uh, on the surface this um, an integral over such a surface can be defined as followed follows with the vector valued surface area element ds being ds du cross ds dv du dv so definition let s be an oriented surface i'll say a few words about what oriented means in just a minute with differentiable parametrization s so that the param so that the partial derivatives derivative of s with respect to u and derivative of s with respect to v are continuous those the differentiability and continuous partial derivatives those are just standard technical hypotheses that assure that this micros uh, that this zooming in on a microscopic part as we had seen in the animation that that is actually justified we want f to be a vector field that is continuous on s that again means that the zooming in will work out as advertised with the animation then the surface integral of the vector field over the surface is double integral over the surface f dot ds where this is the ds and f is the vector field so the ds really is this uh, this this surface normal vector um, that is defined to be the integral over the domain of the parametrization so the domain here that's this d of the vector field dot ds du cross ds dv times the area element in the domain and we can very clearly see what that is this part here is the volume that we talked about on the previous panel which is motivated by this idea that microscopically the vector field transports little parallel epipeds through the surface so these are the volumes of these differential parallel epipeds and the integral then sums all those volumes up to get the net volume that is being transported through the surface the net flux through the surface this integral or its numerical value is often called the flux of the vector field across s and the flux usually is denoted with the letter phi okay so now there are a couple of things that i have to say we talked about this all along as if we are talking about a fluid flow as if mass is actually transferred through a surface and that is a very very good visualization however technically speaking all that we are talking about really is field permeating surface because very often for example in the analysis of the electrostatic field there is nothing that moves it's just field permeating surface and this 
flux then allows us to say a few things about what the field does even if it isn't literally transfer through the surface. So the physical interpretations will now uh, help us understand how the field works even if literally it is not correct. Because for example when people talk about electric flux they speak of it in very much the same terms as we have just done here. However there is no literal transport of anything through the surface. The other thing that I said, and uh, that's what we're going to finish this panel with here, is that this word oriented is something that we haven't defined yet. For practical purposes, an oriented or an orientable surface is a surface that has a very well-defined top and bottom, or a front and back, or an inside and an outside, because only if you have a well-defined inside and outside, top and bottom, uh, front or back, can you actually have well-defined transport of something through the surface, right? If I didn't know whether this surface, whether this was the top or the bottom and whether the underside was the top or the bottom, I wouldn't know in which direction this transport goes and I would have a really hard time aggregating this transport because there could be certain really strange uh, strange cancellations. And if that is something where you're currently thinking, well, that just can't happen, any kind of surface has got to have a front and a back, then that, that is very normal, very natural. Hang on, at the end of this presentation we're going to talk about a few non-orientable surfaces that can actually be constructed and which literally do not have a front and a back. Now certainly for anything that you want to use as a test surface, you want to avoid these things and it takes a more, uh, well, devious slash mathematical mind to think of these things because um, typically people think of things uh, in ways that they are familiar with from their experience and certainly much of what we have in our experience, cylinders, sails in sailboats, spheres and so on, all these things are orientable and therefore we don't, on, on the practical side, don't very often have to worry about non-orientability, which is also a reason why I want to talk about that at the end. Let's first get into the spirit of working out surface integrals. Okay, so now we have the surface integral of a vector field uh, over an oriented surface. We also had a surface integral, a scalar surface integral, and these two integrals actually are related to each other via the following. If we let n being a partial derivative of s with respect to u cross partial derivative of s with respect to v divided by the magnitude of that very same vector, if we let that be the unit normal vector of the surface s, and that is really what this thing is usually call, called, where the surface S is parameterized by the parameterization surface of U and V, then we can express the surface integral of a vector field in terms of the scalar surface integral via the following equation. The surface integral of the vector field dot vector surface area element uh, is equal to the surface integral of the vector field dot the unit normal vector times the scalar surface area element. And uh, this is, in fact, an expression of the surface integral of a vector field that is often used in physics, and we will also use it in our derivation of Stokes' theorem. The derivation actually is not that hard, except that we certainly need to make friends with the definitions. But once we remember them and just go through the computations, it's not that bad, because the surface integral of the vector field is nothing but the double integral over the parameter domain of the vector field at the point dot partial derivative of s with respect to u cross partial derivative of s with respect to v dA. And we can take this and multiply and divide by the magnitude of s u cross s v, which gives us the integral over the parameter domain f of s times s u dot s u cross s v divided by magnitude of SU cross SV times the magnitude of SU cross SV, and we can see very clearly that this here is what we would also call 
the scalar surface area element. This part here is the unit normal vector, which means that this integral really is the double integral over the surface of f dot unit normal vector uh, times scalar surface area element. And that's the proof for that already. Now let's take a look at a few examples to make sure that the computations don't give us any hiccups. The main part is to get the orientations right and to plug the right things into the vector field. So we want to compute the surface integral of the vector field f of x, y, z being y, 3z squared, negative x squared over the surface given by s of u and v being u, v, u plus 3 where u goes from 0 to 1, v goes from 0 to 2 with upward orientation. Now one of the things that you can say here is that this surface can also be expressed as the function z equals x plus 3 and that's perfectly fine and, and there are perfectly good formulas for the surface integral of a vector field over the graph of a function. I don't want to work with those too much. In fact, I don't think you'll see them in my presentations at all because I want to stay with parametric surfaces because parametric surfaces can parametrize everything. If I have a function z equals f of xy, we know that I can parametrize that as xy f of xy, whereas if I have an arbitrary surface to piece that together from graphs of functions, that's a bit harder. And so to economize on memory, I would rather that we go back to the formulas that really are the grandparents of all the other formulas, and those formulas are the ones for surface integrals that involve parametric surfaces. All right, the thing here that I think I'm only saying it here, and, and, and you may not like it too much, but we know everything we need to know. It is all just computation. It's just that the computation is lengthy and has quite a few places where certainly mistakes can be made. That being said, however, we can work our way through that. Namely, what do we need? We need the partial of the surface with respect to its input variables. So we need ds du, which is the partial with respect to u of u, v, and u plus 3, which is just 1, 0, 1, right? We need the partial of s with respect to v, which is the partial with respect to v of u, v, u plus 3, which is 0, 1, 0. And uh, of course, this can get harder for more complicated surfaces, and we're also going to see that. But right now, let's just work with that, and we see now that dsdu cross dsdv is 1, 0, 1 cross 0, 1, 0. Finding the cross product of that gives us 0, minus 1, 0, 0, and 1, minus 0 is 1, so we get negative 1, 0, 1, I think. Yep, negative 1, 0, 1. And what does it mean to have upward orientation? Upward orientation for a surface that is not closed is typically the standard orientation. It says that your normal vector to the surface is supposed to point upwards in the z direction, which means it needs to have a positive z coordinate. This vector has that, so that means this one does point upward and we don't have to worry about that too much. If this vector had turned out to point downward, we would have simply taken its negative and we will summarize that a little bit later on also. So we've got dsdu cross dsdv here. And so now f of s of u and v cross s dot su cross sv. Well, su cross sv is easy and that's deliberate because now I want us to focus on the part of computing f of s of u and v because now all of a sudden we have input coordinates for s which we might still mentally associate with x's and y's. And then we have x output coordinates for the surface and the x, y, and z output coordinates for the surface are actually what is being plugged into the vector field. So if s of u and v is u, v, and u plus 3, that means x is u, which goes here, y is v, and that goes for the y here, and u plus 3 is z, which goes here, which means that f of s of u and v is going to be v, 3u plus 3 quantity squared and negative u squared. And that's indeed exactly what we have here. Dot product with this vector, which we already have, negative 1, 0, 1. And so we get negative v plus 0 minus u squared. So we get negative v minus u squared here as our integrand. 
Well, that means we have to integrate the vector field dot ds. That's now that we integrate from 0 to 1 in u because u goes from 0 to 1. So that's integral 0 to 1 uh, du. We integrate from 0 to 2 in v because v goes from 0 to 2. So that's this integral dv here. And our integrand from the previous panel is negative v minus u squared. And that's now a very quick integral. Integral, if we integrate dv, we get negative one-half v squared minus v u squared. And that goes from v equals 0 to v equals 2, which would mean at v equals 0 we get two zeros, so we don't subtract anything off. At v equals 2 we get negative 2 minus 2u squared, so we get negative 2 minus 2u squared here. We integrate that, we get negative 2u minus 2 thirds u cubed at the bounds 0 and 1, again at the bounds 0. We subtract 0 off, and at the top we get negative 2 minus 2 thirds, which is minus 8 thirds, and that's the answer. So as long as, as everything is given, the computation is straightforward, certainly a little bit of interpretation cannot hurt. And so here, for example, uh, even though, I mean, okay, we know that this surface is a, um, is a plane, or this, this is a segment of a plane. I don't know and don't think that there are naturally occurring vector fields or easily naturally occurring vector fields that look like this. But if there ever is such a vector field, then this minus sign basically says that net transfer of matter that may be transported by this if it was a velocity field goes from the top of the surface to the bottom of the surface. So that means this is a net downflow through this a segment of a sphere here. That's what the sign tells us. If this had been plus, then there would have been a net upflow. Okay, let's take a look at an example that now extends. Okay, let's first look at the algorithm and then let's look at an example that extends this a bit. So to set up the surface integral of a vector field over an oriented surface, we do the following. We need to find a parametrization of the surface and that parametrization must include the domain for the parameters because that'll be our domain for our double integral, right? Then we compute the normal vector SU cross SV. Then we need to make sure that the normal vector points in the right direction. Typically it needs to be stated what in what way the surface is oriented and there are two standard orientations for an open surface. Upward orientation means that your normal vector should have positive Z coordinate. For a closed surface, outward orientation means that the normal vector has to point outward. We're going to talk about that when we talk about the, the next example, which is a cylinder, and it's going to come back to us when we talk about electric flux over a sphere. Um, and then we reverse the normal vector, normal vector sign if necessary, because if we have a normal vector that is supposed to point upward and it points downward, then its negative will also be a normal vector and it'll point in the right direction and it will have the right size because it will be have been computed by SU cross SV. Uh, then we compute the scalar product F of S of UV dot SU cross SV. We have seen that in the previous example. And then we compute the integral of F of S of U and V dot SU cross SV. And if the sign had to be reversed in, in step three, then the desired result is the negative of this integral that we have here. And, of course, there is another possibility, which is that if you already use the negative of the normal vector in step 5, then you don't have to reverse anything because you already have computed an integral in which everything was oriented the right way. Okay, with that, I think we can look at another example. And... This next example of ours is the surface integral of a vector field uh, f of x, y, z being z, x, 0, certainly a bit simpler than, than the one that we had previously, over the surface of a solid cylinder with 0 smaller equal x squared plus y squared smaller or equal to 9, so radius 3 that goes in z from 0 to 5 with positive, which for closed surfaces such as surfaces of solids, is considered to be the outward orientation. So that means that our normal vector has, no, all our normal vectors have to point outwards. Okay, so that's three integrals. 
Uh, and, uh, well, let's just take a look at that because, well, here's a cylinder and we would integrate over the vertical sides, of course, but we also have to integrate over the top and over the bottom. What would the normal vectors look like? Well, the normal vector for the top is a vector that goes straight up and uh, therefore it's a multiple of the vector 0, 0, 1. At the bottom, the normal vector points straight down, so it's a positive multiple of the vector 0, 0, minus 1. And on the sides of the cylinder, if we want to look at the whole thing from above, the normal vectors would go out radially, just following actually these uh, axes of the spider web, right? Um, so that means we know what it looks like, and we're going to use that to our advantage to shrink the problem a little bit, because with the normal vector at the top pointing in the z direction and the normal vector at the bottom pointing in the negative z direction, we know that uh, if we take the dot product of this field with something that's parallel to 0, 0, 1 or 0, 0, minus 1, then the dot product is going to be 0. And so because, as we can also say, because the vector field has a 0, z component, the integrals over the top and the bottom are both 0 because we would get for the product with a normal vector, independent of what the normal vector specifically is, what length it has, we would get z times 0 plus x times 0 plus 0 times whatever we have there, and that's just 0. So that, uh, that kind of argumentation, this kind of geometric argumentation, can be very advantageous, and it, in this case, has reduced our workload, our need to compute integrals from three integrals down to just one integral, and that one is going to be challenging enough. So the rest, however, then again, is just computation. It's going to take a while, but it's just computation. So uh, if we want to parameterize a solid cylinder of radius 3, or the walls of a solid cylinder, cylinder to be exact, of radius 3 and of height 5, well, then surface of u and v will be 3 cosine u, 3 sine u and v, the standard parameterization of a cylinder, which also, of course, is very reminiscent of uh, cylindrical coordinates, what we would call the u theta, and the v would literally be called z. Uh, u goes from 0 to 2 pi, because we want to capture the whole thing all the way around the z-axis, and v goes from 0 to 5, because that's the domain, or that that's the extent along the z-axis. Okay, so now we figure out ds du, that's the derivative with respect to u of 3 cosine u, 3 sine u, and v, which ends up being negative 3 sine u, 3 cosine u, and 0, no problem with that. We find our ds dv, which is the derivative with respect to v of 3 cosine u, 3 sine u, and v, and that is 0, 0, 1. So that means that the dot product is going to be pretty nice, namely, ds du cross ds dv is negative 3 sine u, 3 cosine u, and 0 cross 0, 0, 1, which will give us 3 cosine u minus 0, negative 3 sine u times 1 minus 0, and then an extra negative sign, which would give us plus 3 sine u. And for the z-coordinate, we get negative 3 sine u times 0 minus 0 cross 3 times 3 cosine u, so we get 0 in the z-coordinate. So we get 3 cosine u, 3 sine u, and uh, 0 here. And that one already does point outwards, I think. Yeah, it already does point outwards. Let me make sure that that works. What do we know? We know that the uh, representation of a point in polar coordinates is radius times cosine theta and radius times sine theta, and that's the position vector of the point. So this vector points radially outwards towards uh, the boundary, and then if we attach that on the boundary, then it points outwards from the boundary, and so that really is an outward normal vector here. And so now f dot ds du cross ds dv, what's the problem with that? Well, we have to make sure that we plug in the right things for z and for x. The z was v and the x was 3 cosine u in the parametrization. And so that means we get v, 3 cosine u, and 0, dot product with the ds du cross ds dv, so dot product with 3 cosine u, 3 sine u, 0, which gives us 3v cosine u and 9 cosine u sine u, 3v cosine u plus 9 cosine u sine u, and uh, cosine u sine u is 1 half sine 2u, so this becomes 3v cosine u plus 9 halves 
sign 2u that's our integrand for the integral, which ends up being the integral from 0 to 2 pi for u, because we go all the way around, integral from 0 to 5, because that's the bounds for v, which are the bounds for z, of the integrand that we had just computed, which is 3v cosine u plus 9 halves sine 2u dv du, and that integral turns out to be 0, and that is because we integrate a trigonometric function in u, or two trigonometric functions in u, if you will, namely cosine u and sine 2u, and we integrate both of those over the full period 0 to 2 pi, and we know that if we integrate these oscillating functions over a full period in u, then that integral is going to turn out to be 0. If that is something that bothers you a little bit, go ahead and work out the integral. There is certainly no penalty for doing that, except some time that indeed would be well spent if, if, if you didn't like this argument, and it'll give you the right result. Okay, so we have seen two examples. One where we more focused on actually plugging things into the vector field, because that's something where we have to make sure the right x's go into the right x's, the right y's go into the right y's, and so on, and so on, right? Because we have, of course, we have an x component of the vector field, a y component of the vector field, a z component for the vector field. We have an x component of the input of the vector field, an x component of the, a y component of the input of the vector field, and a z component of the input of the vector field. And then we have an x, y, and z component of the surface, and the input has a u and a v component. And we just have to make sure that all of that is sorted out right, so we get f of s of u and v correctly. That's what the first example had a little bit more emphasis on. The other challenge then, of course, is that sometimes people just tell you what the surface is, and you need to parameterize the surface, which means that these standard parametrizations, as well as the standard tricks that I talked about, in the presentation on parametric surfaces certainly can be very helpful there. And once you have that, then of course we just have to put it all together into a computation. Um, at this stage, you may actually want to take a quick break and maybe do some homework problems or just relax a little bit because now we're going to talk about some physics and about some integrals that get a little nasty but which are nonetheless very, very real because they describe a completely and entirely real natural phenomenon. Now, um, okay, before we get there, another little piece of notation, and that is that surface integrals over closed surfaces are also often denoted with the symbol double integral with a circle, and just like the notation single integral with a circle for line integrals over closed curves, the definition of the integral does not change, it's just that this symbol explicitly indicates that we are integrating over a closed surface as we did in the second example and as we will do in the physics example. Uh, so the notation simply emphasizes that we're integrating over a closed surface. Uh, and we will use this notation for surface integrals over closed surfaces whenever appropriate. All right, physical interpretation the surface integral of a fluid flow over a closed surface basically gives the net volume of fluid that enters or leaves the enclosed volume of space in a given time interval. And this interpretation is even useful in situations where nothing moves, such as in the analysis of the electrostatic field, which comes now. So I want us to solve a very simple physics problem, or a very simply stated physics problem, and that is I want us to compute the net flux of the electric field of a point charge over the surface of a sphere. This literally could be an exercise in probably not quite an introductory ENM class, but in, in a second ENM class where you really start hitting the hard and heavy integrals, and it could be stated exactly like that. And we have to figure out how to set everything up from there, and we're going to walk ourselves through that. So what's the situation? Um, well, when we integrate over the surface of a sphere, we can certainly center the sphere at the origin. That'll make the parametrization of the sphere very simple. And because the sphere has spherical symmetry, well, duh, yeah, sure, I mean, that, that's the name, right? Because that thing has that kind of symmetry, we can also assume without loss of generality 
that the point charge sits on the positive z-axis. So this is the kind of thing that you often hear in physics as well as in mathematics classes that for these problems we are free to choose our coordinate system. And we choose it in such a way that the origin sits in the center of the sphere and so that the z-axis is the axis defined by the location of the point charge and the origin of the sphere. And uh, that means we ultimately look at the following math exercise. The example is we want to compute the flux of the electric field of a point charge located at 0, 0, h over the surface of the sphere of radius r centered at the origin. And we want to use outward pointing normal vectors because the outward orientation is what people typically use in mathematics and physics when nothing else is specified. Okay, so here's the sphere. We have put the center at the origin. The point charge sits here, and if we were for a minute, just for argument's sake, assume that this is a positive charge, then the electrostatic field would be this beautiful radial field that declines with one over the distance, one over the square of the distance from the charge. And of course, that field permeates the surface all the way through. It's just that where the charge is nearer the surface, we will have a stronger field permeating the, uh, the surface than in the locations where the surface is farther away from the location of the charge, which means we really have a vector field that varies over the surface of this sphere. And we can also see that here, for example, the vector field does not exit radially, which is an additional thing where we then need to use um, and which is of course um, taken care of by the uh, dot product that is in the definition of the uh, surface integral of a vector field. All right, well what do we need? The standard encoding for a sphere of radius r is just given by what we are also accustomed to from, um, from spherical coordinates, which is that the uh, parametrization is uh, surface of u and v being radius, cosine u, sine v, radius, sine u, sine v, radius, cosine v, where I deliberately want to call this thing r. This is not the r from uh, cylindrical coordinates. This is just the radius of the sphere, but it's certainly not the rho from spherical coordinates either. This is just a constant, right? And I call these things u and v, even though in spherical coordinates. And if you want to solve it that way on your homework, you could also call this one theta and this one phi and compute derivatives with respect to theta and phi. And there would be no problem with the computation. I just want to explicitly indicate here that this really is a parametrization that certainly is related to spherical coordinates, but it is not spherical coordinates themselves. All right, so u goes from 0 to 2 pi v goes from 0 to pi, just as we always have seen, this encodes the full sphere. And so now the outward pointing normal vectors are negative ds du cross ds dv. That's a negative sign that I put in after the fact because I didn't want to uh, spend too much space here. The computation gets long enough and we will contract a few things. This negative sign is introduced because that's what will make the vector point outwards. We're going to see why at the end of the computation. Right now, let's just go through with the computation. So this is similar to what you can often see when you read a text. People just put in a negative sign and you read on and realize afterwards why the negative sign is put in. Okay, negative dsdu cross dsdv is of course nothing but dsdv cross dsdu. And if I work out dsdv, well, that'll be that I get r cosine u cosine v right here. I get r sine u cosine v right here, and I get negative r sine v right here. ds du would be negative r sine u sine v, which is right here. D, uh, the second coordinate would be r cosine u sine v, which is right here. And the derivative of the z component with respect to u is 0, so this is correct. And now we work out the cross product. For the x component, we get 0 times 0 minus negative r squared cosine u sine squared v. So that would be r squared cosine u sine squared v right here. For the y component, we get 0 minus 
negative r sine v, negative r sine u sine v, so that's three negative signs already. The extra negative sign that we have in the second component makes it four negative signs, so the whole thing will be plus, and it'll be r times r, which is r squared, sine u times sine v times sine v, which is the sine squared v. And finally, the third one gives us r squared cosine squared u cosine v sine v minus negative, so plus r squared sine squared u sine v cosine v. You can factor out uh, the r squared sine v cosine v and you end up with sine squared u plus cosine squared u in parentheses, which gives us 1. So the whole thing for the z component ends up being r squared sine v cosine v. And you can see that this is something that in the first quadrant, where when we put in angles between 0 in the first octant, where we put in angles between 0 and 90 degrees, everything here will be positive, so it'll be pointing outwards, which is what it needs to be. If we had computed dsd u dsd v, we would have had extra negative signs here, we would have had an invert, inward pointing normal vector, and we would have just had to stick an extra negative sign in there to make things work out with an outward pointing normal vector. So that's where that initial negative sign came from. Okay, we have our vectorial surface area element, our surface normal vector that encodes also the area that is associated with things. We now need to figure out what the electrostatic field is, and on the surface of the sphere of radius r that is centered at the origin, the electric field of a point charge Q located at the position P equals 0, 0, H is the following. Well, the electric field is always charge divided by 4 pi epsilon 0, so I'm going with international units, of position where we evaluate minus position of the charge divided by the magnitude of position where we evaluate minus position of the charge cubed. And because this one here is also has magnitude R minus P, magnitude, this actually ultimately really is Q divided by 4 pi epsilon 0 times the distance between the two places squared. Okay, now we go ahead and plug that in. If we have an arbitrary position, but an arbitrary position is always just x, y, z, and p we know is 0, 0, h, so that means this is Q over 4 pi epsilon 0, and then x minus 0 gives us x, y minus 0 gives us y, and z minus this h here gives us z minus h. We've got the q over 4 pi epsilon 0 from here. And the magnitude of this thing here, of this vector here, is of course x squared plus y squared plus z minus h quantity squared, taking the square root of that. And that means that with the exponent 3 that we have here, we end up with an exponent 3 halves over here. Okay, so that's the field. Do we simplify that some more? Um, yeah, we don't simplify it, but now we have to plug in the parametrization of the sphere. So this, uh, if this is shocking to you, yeah, it is to me too. That, that's, that, that's horrible, right? That's a lot of symbols, but there's not much that has happened except that we plugged in x for x and x on the surface of the sphere. And remember, that's what we're interested in, right? What happens on the surface of the sphere. On the surface of the sphere, x is the x component of the parametrization, which is r cosine u sine v. Uh, the y is the y component of the parametrization, which is r sine u sine v. And the z is r cosine v. It's just that here we also have to subtract with the h, and that's the minus h here. And we plugged in in the same way x squared is, of course, r squared cosine squared u sine squared v plus r squared sine squared u sine squared v plus r cosine v minus h quantity squared raised to the 3 halves. So this was a straight textual substitution. This is an edit replace in a word processor, nothing else. And now the hunt is on for simplifications. And what we can see is we've got a cosine squared u here, we've got a sine squared u here. The other terms are, um, are common, so this stuff here should combine into an r squared sine squared v. And that is indeed what has happened here. We've got the q over 4 pi epsilon 0 copied. We've got r squared sine squared v from here. r cosine v minus h quantity squared is kept. The 3 halves is kept. That's just this stuff here. And this vector back here is, of course, nothing but this vector that we have 
from back here. Okay, so what is next? We have the field, we have the surface normal vector uh, encoded in such a way that all we need to do is work out the dot product and so that means that we now have to compute electric field dot SV cross SU because we had reversed the uh, the order in the cross product to get the right orientation and that's equal to well this is now again big and ugly but it's just something where you need to look into your notes or go back to the previous panels this is the electric field at the point that's what we've just worked with and this here was and is the surface normal vector pointing outwards and uh, now we compute the dot product, well, that's not too hard. That gives us r cubed cosine squared u sine cubed v, right? So what we end up with is we need some organization. Well, we've got q over 4 pi epsilon 0. And now we work out the numerator as, as the dot product. And so the r, r cubed cosine squared u sine cubed v, that's as promised. Then we have r cubed here sine squared u times sine cubed v and then we have r cosine v times this which gives us r cubed cosine squared v times the sine v here minus h times r squared sine v cosine v which is r squared h sine v cosine v divided by what we had previously r squared sine squared v and I multiplied out the parentheses r squared cosine squared v minus 2 times r cosine v times h, so minus 2rh cosine v plus h squared, the whole thing still raised to the 3 halves. So, albeit it's becoming a little bit epic, it is still nothing but a computation, and again, the hunt is on for more cancellations, and the first cancellations we can find are that sine squared v and cosine squared v cancel, so these uh, these, this difference, or this, this sum here, will turn into just r, is just r squared. It's not turning into anything that was r squared before and, and will be on the, next, uh, on the next line explicitly. Here we have a cosine squared u and a sine squared u, and everything else is, com is the same, so we can also combine these two terms into r cubed sine cubed v, and that's indeed what has happened. We keep the q over 4 pi epsilon 0, we've got r cubed sine cubed v, then we copy the r cubed sine v cosine squared v, we copy the minus r squared h sine v cosine v, and we have in the denominator r squared from here, plus h squared, I wanted to have the positive stuff out front, minus 2rh cosine v. Now it gets a little bit harder to see common terms, but a sine cubed v is a sine v times a sine squared v. So we've got a sine squared v here, we've got a sine squared v here. So actually we have an r cubed sine v that we can factor out, and in the parentheses we've got sine squared v plus cosine squared v, which is 1, which means in this next step we copy the scaling factor q over 4 pi epsilon 0 out front, and we have then that these two terms here combine to r cubed sine v minus r squared h sine v cosine v divided by the denominator is just copied again. And what we have here is this is our integrand, oh joy, after all these computations and after this simplification, which was rough enough as a reward, we get to integrate this thing in a double integral. Great. Um, there's a little bit of light at the end of this particular tunnel because one of the nice things is that this integral doesn't depend on u anymore. So that means that our double integral of the vector field dot ds over the closed surface, see the cool symbol with a circle here, uh, that will be q over 4 pi epsilon 0, that's a constant we can take out of the integral. The integral in u will go from 0 to 2 pi, and because the integral doesn't depend on u, we can write down this as a du integral right away. And the part that's going to keep us entertained for a couple more panels is that in v we integrate from 0 to pi dv, and we integrate exactly this term that we had on the previous panel. I tried to solve this thing with a computer algebra system that has a somewhat ancient engine, so maybe a newer computer algebra system will do better, but it didn't go so well, whereas as we can see here with a couple of actually 
Not too hard substitutions, which, however, you first have to see and we'll talk our way through it. We can solve this one explicitly. So first step here actually is to realize that this is just 2 pi. So we get q over 2 epsilon 0 because the 2 pi, which is this integral, cancels uh, 2 pi out of here. And then we have the integral from 0 to pi. Notice that we've got a term sine v in common in the numerator, which we simply factor out, that's this sine v here, and so in the numerator we keep r cubed minus r squared h cosine v, the denominator is still the same, but what we have now is something that looks fairly natural for a substitution, uh, I think z equals cosine v is what I've used, or w or something like that, because we've used so many variables now that at some point in time some stuff probably gets reused. Yeah, okay, I said w being cosine v, well, then dw dv is negative sine v, and negative sine v dv is dw, which means this thing here is negative dw. We get w here and here, and we can work out the integral. So we get that this is q over 2 epsilon 0. w is cosine v, which means cosine of 0 is 1. Cosine of pi is negative 1, so this really goes from 1 to negative 1. I really mean that. The integrand is r cubed minus r squared h, cosine v is w, divided by r squared plus h squared, minus 2rh cosine v, which is minus 2rhw, we keep the three halves, sine v dv ends up being negative 1 times dw, and then of course this negative 1 can be used to reverse the integral back to something that looks a little bit more like what we're accustomed to from integrals, namely that the lower bound is below the upper bound, so we end up with q over 2 epsilon 0, Integral negative 1 to 1, r cubed minus r squared h times w divided by r squared plus h squared minus 2 r h w to the 3 halves. Uh, and that at least has gotten us rid of the Drake functions. It's still looking pretty ugly, but now there is just something that may even be born out of desperation. Uh, okay, so here we've just copied what we had on the previous panel. And if you've got an ugly denominator like that, um, I mean, first of all, of course, these kinds of integrals, you'd want to try to solve them with a computer algebra system. If that doesn't work, you use a, an integral table. And for an integral table, you sometimes have to do some substitutions. If you've got something with such an ugly denominator, often a really good idea is to substitute the whole denominator. And that's indeed what we have done here. And I ran out of variables. This z is now not a coordinate or anything. This is just the, it's, it's just an integration variable. So I say z equal r squared plus h squared divided mi uh, minus 2rhw. That would mean that dz dw, here's where it's nice that r and h are constants, right? That's just negative 2rh, uh, and, and that's just a number um, depending on r and h, but r and h don't change with the integral. And so that means that our dw is negative 1 over 2 rh dz, which means we're not messing anything up here, except that we now have a nice denominator. So then in order to take care of this w, we have to solve this equation for w. Well, that's not too bad either. 2 rh w goes over, and we get 2 rh w being r squared plus h squared minus z, which is what we have here. And then we divide by the 2 rh to get w by itself. Okay. So that's what we plug in, and we get q over 2 epsilon 0. Keep it copied. Our substitution is z. Well, when w is negative 1, we get r squared plus h squared plus 2rh, which is r plus h quantity squared. When w is 1, we get r squared plus h squared minus 2rh, which is r minus h quantity squared. Then we've got r cubed from here, r squared h from here. w is r squared plus h squared minus z divided by 2rh from here, we divide by this whole denominator, which is now just z to the 3 halves, that's the whole purpose of doing the whole thing, times the dw, which is negative 1 over 2rh times dz. And as we continue, this negative sign again is going to adjust our integral to bounds where the lower bound is smaller than the upper bound. So we go to the next line, we keep the q over 2 epsilon 0. The negative sign reverses the integral, so it now goes from r minus h squared to r plus h squared. The 1 over 2 r h is nothing but a constant, so we just factor it out. And we still have r cubed minus, and now let's do a little bit of algebra. The h cancels, one of the r's cancels, 
and we end up with an r halves times this numerator, which is now just the parenthesis r squared plus h squared minus z. We've got a z to the 3 halves in the denominator, and we can now see already these are a bunch of numbers divided by z's, and so this is not quite polynomial, but it's something that is just uh, expressible in powers of z. So this is, we keep everything together, q over 2 times 2, 4 epsilon 0 rh is kept, integral bounds are kept as is. What do we have here? r cubed minus r halves times r squared, so r cubed minus r cubed halves gives us r cubed halves. r halves times h squared is r h squared over 2 with a negative sign gives us a minus, and all of that is divided by z to the 3 halves, which means it's multiplied with z to the negative 3 halves. And the only thing we have left to digest is the minus r over 2 times negative z divided by z to the 3 halves. Well, minus minus is plus. r over 2 is just a factor. And z over z to the 3 halves is 1 over z to the 3 halves, which is z to the negative 1 half. Okay, we copy that to the next panel. And even though we've got all these variables flying around integrating z to the negative 3 halves with respect to z, that's something that um, I have recently started saying that in classes we laugh, we do it, we move on. And so the antiderivative of z to the negative 3 halves, well, you add 1 in the exponent, you get z to the negative 1 half, and then you have to make sure you've got the right factor out front, and the factor out front is negative 2. So you get negative 2z to the negative 1 half here. And so that means your antiderivative, for the first one at least, is that you keep the constant out front. That's why we have braces around the whole thing. The negative 2 that I promised times the constant here times z to the negative 1 half. And we have to play the same game here. The antiderivative of z to the negative 1 half. Well, when you add 1 in the exponent, you get 1 half. And the factor that makes sure that your product, that your power rule works out okay, is 2, so the antiderivative of z to the negative 1 half is 2 times z to the 1 half, and you keep the r halves because that's a factor, and then we know that we have to take this in the bounds r minus h squared to r plus h quantity squared, and that simplifies just a little bit because the 2's of course cancel, so we end up with big factor is just kept out front, the 2's cancel, and now here we have an r in common, so we factor out an r. And if we pull the negative sign in, we get minus minus h squared, which is h squared. And we get minus r squared, which is the minus r squared here. Remember that one of the r's has been factored out. We still have the z to the negative 1 half from right here. 2 times r halves is just r. z to the 1 half is kept. And we've also kept the bounds. And now here there is something very nice happening because these squares cancel these square roots. So we end up with, as we plug things in, we keep the factor out front, the q over 4 epsilon 0 rh. We've got r, h squared minus r squared, the square root of r plus h quantity squared, because r and h are both supposed to be non-negative, is r plus h, no need for absolute values, plus r times the square root of r plus h quantity squared, which is r times r plus h, minus, and here's where it gets interesting, because now we have r times h squared minus r squared still, but r minus h, if h is greater than r, that could be negative. And so that means this square root, right, z to the negative one half is just one over square root of z. So this square root of r minus h squared is, as we often say in class and rarely need in class, is actually r minus h quantity absolute value. And that's going to be very important for our analysis of this physical situation. Similarly, r z to the one half square root of r minus h quantity squared is the absolute value of r minus h. And with that, we just, uh, yeah, we simplify this a little bit. And here's where the temptation then sometimes can, can make some things mess up. We keep the constant. h squared minus r squared is h minus r times h plus r, which means the h plus r cancels. Here we get r times h minus r. The r times r plus h we keep. Then here we also have r times h minus r h plus r, but because of the absolute value, we can't directly cancel, because this thing here could be, let's see, let me get something where I can highlight it. Uh, this thing here could be plus 1 or minus 1, and that's going to affect all sorts of things. Uh, but other than that, it's just that we factored the h squared minus r squared. And this one, the last one here, we just copied down.
Okay, so this is what the integral is. This is the result from the previous panel. And if h is greater than r, this is equal to 0. And that is because when h is greater than r, we end up with r minus h being positive. Well, no, we end up with r minus h being negative, but the negative sign being erased. And so when h is greater than r, then the absolute value of h minus of r minus h really is h minus r, which means that this thing here is 1, and this thing here, the absolute value is h minus r. Well, that means that we've got r times h minus r minus r times h minus r. So that goes away, and we've got r times r plus h minus r times h plus r, because this one here is 1, so that means when h is greater than r, this is 0, which means this integral is equal to 0 when our point charge is outside the surface. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. If h is smaller than r, well, if h is smaller than r, we obtain the following. We now have to work on this again, and if h is smaller than r, well, then r minus h absolute value is just r minus h, which means this thing here is a negative one, and then the minus minus gives us something that actually amplifies rather than cancels. And if h is smaller than r, then this is just r minus h here in the back, and that'll also amplify. So we get q over 4, 4 epsilon 0 r times h. r times h minus r is copied. r times r plus h is copied. Then we have, because this is now h minus r divided by r minus h, that's negative 1. Minus minus is plus, so it's plus r times h plus r. And then we have minus r minus h, if h is smaller than r, then this really is just r minus h without the absolute value, so this is minus r times r minus h, and now let's just do straight algebra, multiply everything out. We keep the factor out front, we get rh minus r times r, which is r squared, plus r times r is r squared, plus r times h, plus r times h, plus r times r, which is r squared, minus r times r, which is r squared, minus, minus r times minus h, which is plus r times h, what do we see? We've got minus r squared plus r squared plus r squared minus r squared. All the r squared stuff goes away. We keep a an r squared, two r we keep an rh, two rh's, three rh's, four rh's, so we get four rh. And if we cancel that out, we end up with q over epsilon zero. So what that means physically is that the result only depends on whether the charge is inside the sphere which is h smaller than r, in which case the result is q over epsilon zero independent of where the charge is located, means the net electric flux of an electrostatic field of a point charge inside a sphere is equal to the size of the charge divided by epsilon zero, the dielectric constant, I think it is called. Don't pin me down on the name there right now, but it's, it's a constant that you can find in any ENM text. Um, it does not depend on the position of the charge. No matter how close the charge is to the boundary of the surface or, or to the boundary of the sphere or how close it is to the center of the sphere or even if it's at the center of the sphere, it'll always be Q over epsilon zero as long as the charge is inside the sphere. So that means you can measure how much charge is inside the sphere by just measuring the net electric flux over the surface, which is very fundamental in, in electrostatics, or whether the charge is outside the sphere, in which case h, the position on the z-axis, is greater than r. And in that case, the net electric flux is zero, which means it's also very much in keeping with what we had here, because then we could say the net charge inside the sphere is zero, and then q is zero, and we get zero over epsilon zero, which is zero also. So there are quite a few fundamental physical principles that can be discussed here and should be discussed, and uh, that is something that you will talk about in your physics classes, as well as also with me a little bit as we talk about the divergence theorem, as well as the applications of the divergence theorem and Stokes' theorem within electrostatics as, an, uh, as a motivation as well as 
probably one of the reasons why people started looking for the theorems that look the way that these pinnacles of calculus ultimately do look like. I think this is it for the physics consideration. And so now let's talk about non-orientable surfaces very briefly. Uh, we talk about them briefly because in most applications people will just simply make sure that the surface is orientable and because you actually have to work to make a surface non-orientable but nonetheless these things are quite real. Take a strip of, of material, a, a leather strip or a strip of paper and if you just cut that off of a page for example then certainly you can take this and line it up here and you get the sides of a very flat and wide cylinder and that's an orientable surface because a cylinder has an inside and an outside but you could also twist this thing, this thing here before you merge it up and uh, you would get something that all of a sudden if you travel around this thing with an outward pointing vector that vector would keep pointing outward all the way going around until you reach the twist where the twist is going to take an outward pointing vector and twist it inside and you end up with a vector that is pointing inside as you arrive here. I didn't draw a normal vector, I drew alignment vectors for this thing and if you merge it in, in the cylindrical way then the alignments just stay the same whereas if you twist it then of course the alignments are reversed and these vectors which we would assume to be drawn on the front of the surface. There is now a vector that is drawn on the back of the surface and that's what makes this kind of surface and this surface in particular is called a Möbius band. Um, this surface is non-orientable because of this because if you now assume that as you can verify for yourself if, if you just cut some cut a sheet of paper cut a strip of paper out and do this these two vectors are both on the front of the strip of paper and they will be on the outside as you are merging it together and the markings are just fine but as you do this in the Möbius strip way all of a sudden a marking that used to be on the outside or the front is now on the inside which means that you can travel on something that looks like the outside and you reach your point of origin and you're on the opposite side for some reason. That is the principle behind non-orientability. The abstract definition is that if you have a surface with differential par parameterization surface of u and v and the normal vector which you can compute independent of whether the thing is orientable or not, uh, the unit normal vector then being SU cross SV divided by the magnitude of SU cross SV, then this thing is called oriented or orientable if and only if for every closed curve on the surface the function normal vector at the location of the curve is continuous and that's exactly what goes wrong with this Möbius band here because if I follow this normal vector all the way around on a curve then what happens is we point outward, we point outward, we point outward in the way that we would think of it as we would think of it as pointing outward on the cylinder but then at this stage the normal vector would point towards us and the twist would make the normal vector point inward and we would come back to our point of origin we would have followed this parameterization in a continuous fashion and we end up with something that at the end is non-continuous and that is then of course happening because we're having this thing that we typically circumvent in integrations when we integrate over volumes for example which is that we're running into this problem that for polar coordinates as a coordinate system angle, e angle theta equals zero is the same as angle e theta equals two pi which is something that if you work this parameterization out all of a sudden when you plug in two pi you've got things that work entirely different than they did at zero. So this is something that gets rather technical mathematically which is why in a first calculus class and in, in many very good applied classes you don't worry about these things too much. Sometimes my colleagues in applied mathematics as well as certainly my colleagues in engineering will say yeah that is something that the mathematicians or the theorists worry about. Interestingly enough every so often these things can and do make a comeback because a long time ago I had a colleague who was and is an applied mathematician who was interested in designing agitators for 
chemical reactors where of course chemical reactors are not something where things necessarily explode but simply vats that have to be stirred to keep a chemical reaction going and when you do that you do that with a propeller and what you want to have is maximum agitation the thing that can happen then is that uh, through viscosity as well as just through adhesive forces particles can stick to the front and the back of the propeller that is supposed to agitate the whole thing and you don't get the best possible mixing. The idea that this colleague had was, hey, what about using an agitator that doesn't have a front or a back, which means that particles technically really can't get stuck to the front or the back because there is no such thing. And so he started designing agitators for chemical reactors that were shaped like these Merbio strips with one twist, I'm not sure if he went also to multiple twists or so, but he ultimately actually came up with designs for agitators that were able to give better agitation than comparable agitators. And so that then certainly shows that something that every so often, I'm not going to say always because it simply hasn't been the case, um, but every so often the really abstract stuff also can come back and have applications. For most of us who go through calculus and want to use calculus, the main thing we're going to take away from this is just an awareness that these things exist as a pitfall, but potentially also as an opportunity. All right, you've just fought your way through a lot of nasty computation. The next thing, of course, is that you fight your way through those same and well, hopefully not, not more complicated computations than what we've done in the apps electric flux, but you will certainly have to fight your way through comparable computations on the homework, take a break, and then hit those computational problems, and as you go along also try to think about what the surface integral means, because that's what's going to come back to us, and it's going to help us very much as we understand the divergence theorem as well as Stokes' theorem. Divergence theorem is next. I'll see you there.